Chapter 7, Probability. Probability is nothing but a long-running frequency or the count of any given outcome. So let's say you want to find out how, what is the probability that Microsoft stock will turn into red tomorrow, meaning it will open and it will close into negative then that's a probability. You can look at the historical data and find out like at every single point, you know, what is the probability that a given day Microsoft becomes negative from the time it opens to the time it closes, it actually is negative. Or let's say you're trying to make an investment decision and you're trying to find out like, hey, for my systematic investment plan, how long should I be investing? How, how many months should I be investing? So that the possibility, the probability of the outcome is positive investment returns. So you may find out that, hey, if you invested over, let's say 10 months, I'm just giving you an example, every month if you invested that your probability of losing money in, let's say, Microsoft is very low or less than, less than 5%, um, then that gives you some sort of confidence. It gets you into the mode of predicting the future. So probability is all about knowing what are the odds against certain events happening or what are odds in favor of certain things happening. That's where probability comes in. It's applicable all over the place. Like, let's say a banker is trying to give a loan. They want to find out like, hey, what is the probability that this person that I'm giving a loan with these characteristics will default or will not pay on time? Or if you take a medical exam and you want to find out that, hey, the probability that this, this diagnosis of this exam is, is uh, let's say, diagnosed that you have cancer, but then what's the probability that the diagnosis is correct? So all of that is when you have to look into like what is the confidence, what is the long running history, what does the data show in the past when that this happens that the probability, the chances of an outcome is X versus Y, right? So that's where probability comes in. We took some real life examples and we're going to learn probability with simple six rules, right? And the key takeaway from all of this is um, this law of large numbers. So over time, if you look at uh, Microsoft stock, let's say, for the last week, and you try to make a prediction based on that, like seven days of data, the eighth day, the prediction is actually gonna be very poor. The probability numbers is gonna be all over the place because there's lots of fluctuation. But when you look at like, let's say, years of data, two years of data, there's this 200 day moving average and whole host of other metrics, those are large numbers. When you look at large numbers of data, then the probability actually converges to a number. That is the law of large number. Law of large number is basically saying, the frequency count or the probability count actually converges to a number, which you can use as a benchmark to say, hey, how is this doing? How is this investment doing? How is my team performing? How is this uh, algorithm performing? How is this model doing? So there's a benchmark, there's a law of large numbers that, that, that is very powerful that we should use in the context of probability, right? So relative frequency of an outcome converges to a number as the number of observation increases. So this is very powerful. Even the normal distribution that we looked at in the quantitative uh, chapter number six, that's also like the bell curve distribution. A lot of those patterns are repeatable. So you can actually make a judgment call, a gut feel based on data that tells you how well your organization is doing, how well your investment is doing, how well the tests are doing compared to other benchmarks and how well the, it should be, and if it's if there's there's a big discrepancy, you can go and change it. So law of large numbers was a big takeaway. We took some examples. It's, it's basically a running frequency, right? A long running frequency of a given outcome is a probability. So now let's look at six rules. So let's let's take this rectangle, and we call it uh, the sample space. Let's say for every given thing, let's say this is Microsoft stock, right? And we're going to stick to that throughout the example. Let's say tomorrow morning Microsoft stock opens and you know, there's some outcome, positive or negative, then that is this space. It's, it combines everything. Right? It could either be positive, it could be negative, or it could be just the same. But this diagram, this triangle, it's called a Venn diagram. It, this is sample space is everything, all possible outcomes, positive, negative, equal. There's no third, there's no fourth. Sample space has everything. Let's take A, it's an event that it's actually a positive outcome that Microsoft opens as 200 and closes at 210. So that's, let's say, an event A, that it actually closes at a positive outcome. And A, and then there's A complement, which is anything but A, right? So it could be that Microsoft closes negative or Microsoft remains, stock remains the same. So that's A complement, right? So A plus A complement is equal to one. So A complement 
probability of A complement is 1 minus probability of A, right? Because probability of something happening is always 100%. One probability of A equals 1 means 100% something's going to happen, either positive, either negative, or it's going to be the same. So that is 1. 1 means 100%. Um, probability A complement is 1 minus probability of A, right? That's the rule number two. Rule number three, there are two events, a positive outcome and a negative outcome. So they are mutually exclusive, right? You can either have a positive or a negative. You can't have like a positive and a negative outcome, right? So these are mutually exclusive events. If, if we were to say this A is a positive stock outcome and uh, B is a negative stock outcome, if A happens and B absolutely cannot happen, you don't see a stock price closing positive and negative at the same time, right? So if, if we are just gonna take this Microsoft stock example, stock performance, right? And so there are three outcomes, positive, negative, no change, right? So if positive happens, then negative doesn't happen. Negative happens, positive doesn't happen. So probability of A or B, meaning either a positive or a negative outcome, is probability of A plus probability of B, right? Either both of these two happen is to add both of them because they're disjoint. There's nothing that they share in common. So these are mutually exclusive slash the joint events. So that's rule number three. Now, let's look at uh, probability rule number four. When there is a joint, Microsoft stock is not a good example here, right? Um, uh, because you can't, it's always gonna be mutually exclusive uh, event. Now let's take another example um, where you have A and B happening at the same time. I'm coming up with an example. Let's say movie ticket and the uh, movie type. Um, so um, given movie time, let's say A is the time uh, of the movie show, and then this is the type of the movie. The type could be like, uh, you know, drama, it could be various types of uh, action. So let's say this is type uh, action. So probability that a given time is 9 p.m. and, and it's action. So now they both can happen at the same time, but there could be many many 9 p.m. shows, there could be many action shows, but they're both happening at the same time, there is some overlap. There may be one movie which is 9 p.m. and action. So that's a good example when you see an event happening that, that there's something shared between the two. So now if you want to find out probability of A or B, you know, either A happens or B happens, meaning all the 9, 9 p.m. shows and all the action shows minus because there's going to be some that are that we counted twice in the A and in the B, right? So you want to remove one. So probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A intersection B because A intersection B, that thing is counted as part of B and it's also counted as part of A. So you want to reduce one. So that is the addition rule. Probability of A or B, it's basically saying that hey, 9 p.m. show or drama show is equal to all 9 p.m. shows plus all drama shows minus the intersection of 9 p.m. and drama shows, right? Because they're gonna be counted twice. That's the addition rule. Similarly, we have the multiplication rule, but that only applies for independent events. Now, are A and B independent? A and B are independent when probability of A and B equals probability of A times probability of B. So now let's look at this example. Right? Probability of A is equal to 0.3, which is this, let's say this is the 9 p.m. show, and this is the action show. So we see, hey, 30% chance that, uh, you know, uh, this uh, from all the movie tickets, only 30% uh, of all of them are at 9 p.m., and 40% that, hey, they are at an action show. Given all the movies, only 40% chance that they're action shows. And then the, the joint probability is 0.12. So it's a given movie, the 9 p.m. show, and it's an action show, it's 0.12. So if you see this, 0.3 multiplied by 0.4 is equal to 0.12. When you see the intersection equals the multiplication of the two, then you can easily conclude they are independent. Basically, independent was, was a tricky thing for me to get right in terms of my mental intuition. So what I understood was there is, there is only one point. There's only enough area that if it is common between the two, that A does not impact B and B does not impact A. And that is when A and B, when you multiply their probability, it's equal to their intersection. So in this case, it is 0.12 is equal to 0 0.3, 0 0.4, so A and B are independent. 
But look at this. Isn't this the area of intersections much, much larger? So probability of A is 0.3, probability of B is 0.4. Again, as the same, A is, is, is the same 9 p.m. show, and B is the drama show, or action show, but the intersection is 0.2, meaning they're not independent, because A times B is 1, 2, 0.12, but it is actually 0.2. So in real life, this is what happens. Most events are not independent. They're always second-order effects. That's the learning here. When, let's say, someone is trying to give a loan, a banker is trying to give a loan, right? And uh, he either approves or disapproves, and he sees that someone defaulted from a given company that is not performing well, and then he gets another employee. He gets another employee. He tells the other employee, saying, hey, look, this company is not doing well, and then that you know, employee at that first at that company actually defaulted. So now the second banker is actually impacted by the first banker's decision. When you have these second order effects, when one event impacts the other event, then they are no longer independent. And that happens when there is sufficient overlap or beyond a certain point, you see that there is overlap. So here in real life, um, we have to very, very be careful that, hey, are these events independent? Because if they are not, then you can't just add them like this. P of A uh, or B is not P of A plus P of B. It's actually minus the P of A intersection B. And so now if you have 30 events, then you would want to start subtracting all of those intersections. And that's where Boole's inequality comes in to help with this probability calculation. It says, hey, P of A or B or C or D or the 30 there's such events, you just add up the probability un only under one re condition, which is if the probabilities are small. So that's where Boole's inequality comes in when you can keep adding them up. It's just an approximation because that's why it says is less than or equal to, I forgot I wrote this wrong, less than or equal to the summation of all of those individual probabilities. Hopefully this was useful. Six simple rules of addition, multiplication. Um, the key one is the law of large numbers to keep in mind and that you use this for real life. If you find out that, hey, um, there's certain uh, probability that's shared with you and then you see in your real observation that, hey, it's fluctuating. And if it keeps fluctuating, even after a long set of observation, that means there is a pattern. Otherwise, law of large number tells you that it's going to converge to a number. But if it doesn't converge and if it just keeps going up and down, that means there is a pattern. There is no like, uh, um, they're, they're all related, the events are related. So that's important. All right, great. We are going to get into this in much more detail. Uh, hopefully, this will help us to understand uh, that disjoint events, uh, mutually exclusive events, does not mean that uh, they are independent. This looks independent, right? It says, hey, A is independent of B because they don't have anything in common, but the word independence is tricky. Independence actually means that there is some intersection. So there, there is some intersection, but there's that... Uh, there is that sweet spot where a and b multiply and then the equation is equal to, um, uh, and if the pro some multiplication is equal to the same as the intersection probability, then they're said to be independent. Um, but if it's greater, then it's not. If it's lesser, then it's not again, right? So independence is, is when there is that sweet spot, which is an important learning, an important distinction for us to keep in mind. And hopefully we can use this in real life and we'll continue our building on all of these learnings in the next chapter. Thanks.